Welcome back to Announcements Mineral Springs. It is so good to be back in the swing of things. We are getting even more back to normal, to the real normal here at church because we talked in church council and finance about getting back to Sunday school. And so we want you to know that July the 5th, we are planning on getting back to Sunday school one way or the other. Hopefully the restrictions will be lifted and everyone will feel good about getting back into their Sunday school classes. If not, we are going to have various classes in different areas across the church while still maintaining social distance and all that jazz. And so we want you to be informed and to be aware of us getting back to Sunday school on our Independence Day, July the 5th. Tonight is our business meeting. I want you to be here at six o'clock to talk about some things going on in our church life, how the Lord has blessed us and to celebrate Jesus. Lord bless you, love you. Let's enjoy the service together. Hello, Mineral Springs. Today we are trying a new way to show you our slideshow. As you will notice a TV over my right shoulder let us know if that works for you and how you feel about it because we want this experience to be great for you. I would invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5. Remember, we're going through the Beatitudes of our Lord Jesus, the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, and the Lord Jesus shows us all of these attitudes that give blessing when we have them. And so today we're going to look at one that is really very difficult and particularly for me because it says, blessed are the meek. The scripture says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And I know this, this is one where I'm preaching from God's word, not from experience. This is somewhere that God is still working in me in my heart, in my life, and I pray that if the Lord shows you that He is working on you, then you will listen and you will go to the Lord and ask Him to help for you to obtain meekness, to obtain humility, to obtain patience for the cause of Christ. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get into our message. Dear Heavenly Father, it is in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, that we come to you today. Lord, we ask that you would use this message to work in the hearts of your people. Lord, if there are those who are listening today who do not yet know Christ, that you, God, would speak to them through this time to turn unto Jesus, to be saved, and that each of us, Lord, who know you, would strive for meekness after our Savior, that we can be the ones who will one day inherit the earth. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so first of all, the Bible does have a lot to say about meekness, about this attribute, this attitude. And we're not going to be able to get into all of it today, but I do want to show you an example of a leader in meekness. And that was Moses. Moses, God chose him. God set him apart really from birth and began to provide for Moses. And Moses was known as a humble and a meek leader. He wasn't a perfect leader, but he was very meek. The scripture tells us in verse in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. So Moses, as a leader, was called the most meek person before the Lord Jesus in all the earth. And what we see about Moses is that he comes to a place where his leadership is challenged, and he doesn't do anything about it. We see him come up, and God himself steps in and stands in the place for Moses because, I believe, of his meekness. And so this is a quality that you want for yourself because God 
stands up for the meek, and God rewards those who are meek. Colossians chapter 3 in verse 12 says this, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, and in these three qualities, humility, meekness, and patience. And we're going to look at these individually today because that is what we see in this scripture, that we are to be meek and that we are to strive for meekness and ask God to work this in our hearts. Meekness is strength that is under control. Part of being meek, one should also have strength, but that strength is not exerted. The force is isn't used, whether it's authority, whether it's power, it's God-given strength that is under control and that understands ultimately God is in control. I'm not a huge sports fan, but I love the story of Tony Dungy, who is a Christian, who's a believer. And the story goes like this. He came to the team and he just talks. And there's noises in the background. He just keeps talking. And finally, everybody just kind of hushes up and gets quiet. And he says, that, you know, hey, I'm Tony Dungy, and I want you to know I'm never going to talk to you in a volume above this. Just a very meek, humble, world champion. Meekness is an attribute that has power and strength, but it is under control. Just like Moses strong, strong leader chosen by God to lead his people. Moses, remember, in his past was a murderer, but yet God sees fit in his word to point out that Moses was more meek at this point in his leadership than anyone else on the face of the earth. Not only is meekness strength under control, but meekness is being thick-skinned. If you are going to be a meek person and a meek leader, you have to have th thick skin. One problem today in our culture that I hope you see is people are so thin skinned, not only can you see their veins, but you can see the blood going through it. I mean, people are so easily offended. It's, it's not funny. It's actually sad. But being meek is striving not to be offended by what people do or what people say to you. And so if you're a meek person, you're not going to be easily offended. It's a spiritual trait. We'll talk about it more in just a little bit. Thirdly, meekness is waiting on others. There's an element of meekness that is always grouped with patience. And patience is a different blessing, a different attribute, a different attitude. But it goes along with meekness. So often in the Bible we see it. The Apostle Paul mentioned it in Colossians 3.12. And we see that we, in order to be meek, we also have to be patient. We can't let our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our family, our siblings, we can't let them get to us with the speed at which they do things. Also, we can't, in order to be meek, get upset with God when he doesn't do things in the timing we want him to do. When we talked about being poor in spirit, that was much of our relationship with God, understanding that we don't come to him with, with really anything. We come empty-handed, and he blesses us. Meekness is more about our relationship with each other and how we treat one another. And so I want to give you a couple of points today that will help you in hopefully, to grow in meekness, to be a meek person, strong and yet reserved because of your trust in the Lord. So, first off, number one, in order to be meek, work toward humility. Work toward humility. This is a lifelong battle. Please hear me. Please listen. No one, no person, on the face of planet earth, has come to the point where they no longer need to work on their humility. I know for myself, and I don't say this just to be self-deprecating, but this is an area, a tremendous area of growth in my life, in my spiritual journey. 
I know this because sometimes it comes out. The people who are closest to me talk to me about the need for me to grow in humility because my relationship with other people, pride comes out. Whether it's trying to be funny, to want to be liked, whether it's trying to one-up someone, whatever it is, that comes out in me. I wonder if by the power of the Holy Spirit in you, you would be willing to look into your heart and ask God to show you where you lack humility. God has blessed us to know that we are blessed if we are meek. And the reward is the earth. This is going to come from other scripture, but it's important to understand that this meekness that we desire will not be had unless we become humble in our thoughts, humble in our actions, and ultimately humble in our habits. So our thoughts turn into our actions, which turn into our habits, which make up our personality and who we are. So strive for, work towards humility. We're going to tell you how to do that, but first look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Paul Ask this of the church. He says, I entreat you, I, Paul, myself entreat you, by what? By the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. He says this. He shows his meekness, but he tells them, because Jesus was meek, you strive to be meek. So this is something to work towards, to work towards humility. It's an area in each of our lives that we see from these Beatitudes that we want, we desire to be humble people and ultimately to be meek. So how do we do it? Number one, love truth more than being right. Love and desire God's truth, that which is true, more than you love and desire yourself being right or being made to seem right in front of other people. One of the tells, one of the signs of someone who struggles with humility is they always have to be right. And if you are like that, if you struggle like that like I do, then you need to know right off the bat, you have an issue with pride, you have an issue with lack of humility. When we always want to be right, when we want to prove other people wrong, there's something in our hearts that has yet to submit to the Lord. Let me say this. In your marriage, if it's more important for you to be proven right than it is for you to have peace in your home, you're the one who has the problem. When those fights happen, and, and you know it as well as I do. Children see it and they learn from us. Is it more important to be right and to show that we're right and we're strong? Or is it more important to have peace? One of the things that I tell couples when we're doing premarital counseling is this. Are you more concerned about winning or about being right? Because sometimes in order to win the fight, in order to win the real battle that's going on, Listen, the best thing for our marriage is to say, you're right. It's hard. It takes humility. It takes the grace of our Lord Jesus. So, love truth. That means that you love God's truth, you love the truth, even if it doesn't go along with your point or your idea. That's the big problem in our country today, right? The big problem in our country today is people are dead set on being their, their values, their system being the way so that they say things like they like truth above facts. Things that are crazy that don't make any sense. Why? Because they don't really love truth. They really want to make themselves look right. Number two, we've got to move on. Learn to be others focused. I could tell you don't be self-centered. That's what this is, right? Well, it's more than that. It's not just not focusing on oneself, but it is focusing on other people. Intentionally looking, asking God, praying, thinking, 
God, how can I be used to help other people? And for you, this may come natural. You may be someone who just naturally looks to help other people. For others of us, this is hard. This is a challenge. This is difficult. And if that's you, you've got to make an effort, and you've got to have it in prayer, and you've got to be challenged. How can I, by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit in me, how can I focus my thoughts, my behaviors, on what is best for others instead of what is best for myself? We live in a very me-centered society. It's what have you done for me lately? What's in it for me? And one of the blessings of meekness is to be able to look outside and say, what can I do for the Lord that's going to matter for eternity? That will be ultimately for my reward, but it's because I love King Jesus. Number three, very simple don't jump to conclusions. A lot of times when pride flares up, whether it's in relationships, friendships, or family, it's because someone jumps to a conclusion. Immediately, we think that sibling did it on purpose. We think they hurt us and they meant to do it. We think that that person's actions are taken and that are directly against us. I remember at my first pastorate, a lady stopped coming to church. And, you know, people called her. I called her and tried to get her to come back to church. And she told me why she was upset. And her reason was, and I don't know if this happened in a dream. I don't know if this was something I said from the pulpit. But she said that I had called her stupid. She said, well, the reason I'm not coming back to church is because you called me stupid. And I said, oh, I'm so, so sorry. I don't know how or, or what I said to communicate that. But I want you to know, I do not think you're stupid. Please forgive me and please come back to church. Now, she came back to church. If I had called her stupid, I have no memory of it. I don't know if it was in something I said. I don't know if she dreamed it. I don't know what happened. But I knew right then I had the power, by God's grace, to be able to say something to not jump to a conclusion and say, I never called you stupid. What are you talking about? That's crazy. How dare you say that about me? You trying to start rumors? Then what would have happened? Well, she wouldn't have come back to church. She would have said, that's exactly right. He's exactly how I thought. And I failed like that many times. But God gave me grace in that time. And he gave me the words to say. And I was able to make peace. I encourage you. Try not to jump to conclusions. Try not to look at people and think the worst of them. We're all sinners. Some of us are sinners saved by grace. Others are not yet saved. Don't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. Why? Number four, you ain't perfect. What about that, grammarians? Listen, you're not You need to know it, and you need to live understanding. I need to know I'm not perfect. You need to know your children aren't perfect. Your your wife, your husband, they're not perfect. We're flawed people, and we survive by the grace of God. And when you have an attitude that you're not always right, that you're going to make mistakes, You understand people better, and people will be much more understanding of you. So live with that attitude of humility that you know you're a sinner. Prayerfully, you're a sinner saved by grace. And since God has forgiven you, you're going to know, since you're not perfect, you're going to live in a world and you're going to forgive other people who likewise aren't perfect. And that's how God expects us to act. One big way that Christians need to mature in this is number two, back to our main outline, grow thick skin. We talked about this earlier, but this is an experience for Christians. And for today's culture, I mean, it is so sad, guys. I I feel sorry for some of our, our, our friends who they are so very easily offended. 
whether it's something about, dare I say, race or politics or uh, preference that they have. People are just looking for ways to be offended. And it is a sickness. It is a sin sickness in their heart that's gone to their head. Don't be like that. That's how the world is in America right now. You instead, you have to work as a Christian in 2020 to grow thick skin. So that for you, when someone says something insulting, instead of you being personally offended, you take one for Team Jesus. And you let it roll off your back. And you work at being thick-skinned and taking insults so that those things don't bother us, so that we can stick to the big matters of life that are eternal. Back to Moses. This thing that happened to Moses, here's what was going on. It was Miriam and his brother Aaron, and they were against Moses. They said and spoke against Moses because of this Cushite woman that he had married. For he'd married a Cushite woman, and they didn't like it. And so they said to one another, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And then the Bible says these words. It says, And the Lord heard it. Yahweh God heard their complaint against his servant, and then he acted. And dear ones, we don't want to be in that place. They were so easily offended that Moses did this thing that they didn't agree with. Whether it was right or wrong, they did not trust the Lord. They did not go to Moses. They didn't do the right thing. They tried to make a plan themselves to usurp God's anointed, and it failed miserably. And so I say for you, strive in your heart, in your mind, to hold your tongue, and to really not be so easily offended. Here's a quote that from one of my favorite books outside the Bible by Richard Sibbs. It's called The Bruised Reed, and it says this, It were a good strife amongst Christians, one to labor to give no offense, and the other to labor to take none. The best men are severe to themselves, tender over others. Brother Sibbs basically says this, You ought to work, yes, to not offend people, to strive to give no offense, but also we need to work just as hard to not take offense. Don't be easily offended. Don't be thin-skinned. Take one for Team Jesus, and the Lord will bless you. I promise He'll bless your spirit. He'll bless your dealings. Number three, learn patience. Ah, the gift of patience. My patience has grown. My patience is not great. Whether it's as a husband, a pastor, a teacher, it, I need patience. Maybe you're like me, and I heard people a lot in my life say, don't pray for patience. Well, that's just baloney, okay? Any good spiritual gift that we need, we pray and we ask God and we think about it. We need patience, okay? The biggest thing that God has worked in my life to give me patience is working uh, with children, that having four children, and I'm not where I need to be. But he has stretched me in my patience, in my marriage, as a pastor, knowing that a church, as a pastor, sometimes you see things that need to change, and it may take seven years. It may take ten years. It may never get done because it takes patience. And going at the wrong speed, sometimes moving too fast, sometimes moving too slow. We all need to learn patience. So strive in order to be meek like Jesus, to learn patience. In order to inherit the earth, learn patience. I told you, our Lord Jesus, he was in a part quoting one of the Psalms. We'll see it here. But what did he say? He said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, I want to tell you this story 
about my junior year, I believe it was, in high school. And we had a great teacher. He was a pastor. His name was Mr. Morrow. And Mr. Morrow was teaching our advanced chemistry class. And what he did, it was so difficult. I could see his stress. And at that time, I know you're not going to believe this, but I was one of the good kids, at least in Mr. Morrow's class, because I respect him. I love the guy. I looked up to him. And in that class, it was Valentine's Day, and I was giving everybody Valentine's. And I was trying to think of something cute and clever. And on his Valentine, I wrote, Patience is a virtue. I'd heard somebody say it. I didn't really know what a virtue was, but I knew it sounded cool. And I gave it to Mr. Morrow, and he opened up that Valentine, and he read it. And it meant the world to him. It was like he thought I understood, and I did a little bit, of how difficult it was for him to deal with us rambunctious kids and all that we were doing and not paying attention while he was giving this extra effort to teach us this very difficult subject in high school. I still think about that, and I still think about how the Lord blessed me through his patience. When you are patient with people, God will bless you and he will grow you. Our Lord Jesus was referring, at least in part, to Psalm 37. Verses 7 through 9 says this, Be still before the Lord, be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. And then it says, which it has said before, Fret not over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. In other words, don't worry what is happening with evil people. You trust in the Lord. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. Don't worry. It tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, watch it, shall inherit the earth, shall inherit the land. It's the same word in the original languages. What we see here is Jesus is ultimately calling back and saying these blessings have been in place. Blessed are those, blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Strive for meekness, dear ones. God will so richly bless you. Heavenly Father, help us as your people to grow in meekness that we might serve King Jesus, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you and hope to see you next time.